Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, another episode of the COVID reality check experience. This time I'll speak very briefly about flares on college campuses and the issue of complications. And I'll speak briefly because I just wrote a quite extensive column addressing both and putting this all in the context of epidemiology and the recent report out of Iceland about the relatively low rate of mortality in the total population and the extremely low rate of mortality in those under age 70. So refer back to that as well. So having written about this at length, let me sum it up quickly. First, overwhelmingly it really does look as if infection is prone to be mild and asymptomatic in young healthy people. The, the study out of Iceland, uh, if anything, underestimates the number of total people infected, but even so reaches the conclusion that of the total population exposed, the infection fatality rate is 0.3 percent, 3 per thousand infected. And in people under 70, so we're not just talking about young people, but everybody under the age of 70, the infection fatality rate is 0.1 percent or 1 per thousand. But this study, and again, this was the topic of a prior column, was based entirely on antibody testing. And we now know that antibody testing very decisively undercounts the, the percent of the population that's been through an infection because a lot of people who've had mild infection, which by the way, preferentially as young healthy people, don't make the kinds of antibodies that we measure in seroprevalence studies. So it's probably not 0.3% and 0.1% because if twice as many people have been through an infection as we've managed to count with antibodies, it's half that. And so the numbers go down and, and down. Uh, so what I describe in, in my most recent column and can mention here is that there are really four paths through the pandemic and they can be summarized in a two by ta two table uh, where we have case counts, and casualty counts. And a casualty, and this is important, is any bad outcome. So hospitalization is a casualty. A long-term complication of any kind, cardiac inflammation, is a casualty. And obviously death is a casualty. So we, we can include all of that in the casualty counts. So there, there are four possible paths through the pandemic in that two-by-two two table. We can have high case counts or low case counts, and we can have high casualty counts or low casualty counts. And my argument is that although low case counts, low casualty counts may sound appealing, that means nobody's been exposed to the virus. That means everybody remains vulnerable to the virus. And that means lockdown is going to rule your life until there is a highly effective, very safe, mass-produced, uniformly distributed vaccine. And as I am recording this, we just had the news in the last 24 hours that a major vaccine trial has been halted temporarily because of a significant adverse effect, apparently, of the vaccine, transverse myelitis, acute inflammation of the spinal cord. And this was inevitable. You, you don't sprint effortlessly to vaccine production. There, there are prone to be complications and challenges along the way. Sorry about the noise in the background. Uh, so we, we don't get a guarantee that we're going to have a perfectly safe, highly effective, mass-produced, uniformly distributed, uniformly accepted vaccine this time tomorrow, or in a week, or in a month, or we just don't know, and we have to accept that. So between now and then, whenever then is, the low case count approach means lockdown, poke your noses out, and then if people get infected, lock down again, and that's the New Zealand experience. And frankly, that's no way to live. Yes, you can avoid casualties, but you have to give up your life. Uh, high case counts, high casualties has been associated with Sweden. It's also appropriate to um, label the United States with that approach, although Sweden did it on purpose. We did it by accident. So, you know, at least, at least Sweden had a plan. Uh, we, we basically blundered our way into uh, high case counts without protecting the most vulnerable high casualty counts. Um, obviously, having low case counts and high casualties is an unmitigated disaster. That basically means you let the virus circulate only in nursing homes or some ludicrous thing. So let's talk about the fourth cell, which is high case counts, low casualties. 
I think this is the way through the pandemic. I always thought this was the way through the pandemic. When I talked in the beginning about total harm minimization by means of vertical interdiction, risk stratified interdiction, this is what I was talking about. So when we see a flare in case counts on college campuses, that is not a reason to send all the kids home, declare that the sky has fallen and shut society back down. Rather, if we see high case counts on college campuses among young healthy people and nobody's really getting sick, we're finding that there are case counts because we're looking for the infection, but nobody's getting very sick. Most have no symptoms at all. Nobody's getting hospitalized. Leave the kids right where they are. They are basically the fast track through the pandemic. The virus circulates among young healthy people. They develop immunity with or without antibodies we can measure. They don't get harmed, but they do help develop herd immunity. And the only reason and, and I argue this in the column and in my prior column, the only reason that we tend to think about herd immunity as heresy is because we're living in the wrong cell of that two-by-two two table. We're living in the high case count, high casualty cell. And yeah, I would agree, if the only way to get to herd immunity is a high casualty count, we should reject it. But it's not. We can have a high case count and a low casualty count if we preferentially allow those who can most safely get through this infection to be the ones to confront it while keeping the rest of us safely away and then phasing our way back to normalcy. And colleges seem to represent a perfect opportunity to do this. But there's more to the story. Let, let's just say that the mortality uh, toll among those infected is 0.3 percent. I, I frankly think it's much lower. But if we use that number out of the recent Iceland study, which, by the way, is consistent with all of the other global data we have, the high end of the infection fatality rate is probably 0.3%. What if we apply that number to the United States? Well, we've had 200,000 almost uh, deaths in this country. Well, we can reverse engineer the denominator. We've done a miserably wretched job of testing for mild cases, so we, we don't know what the denominator is, the total number infected. We can reverse engineer it. 200,000 is 0.3 percent of what? That's X, that's algebra, sorry folks. Uh, the answer is 67 million. We have not had 6 million cases of COVID in the United States. We've had 67 million cases of COVID and that assumes that the 0.3 percent is right. If it should be half of that, and then we've had twice that number. We've had 135 million cases. Um, 67 million is one out of every five of us. 130 million is more than one out of every three of us. And what this means is everything we have heard or read or worried about related to the rates of complication or hospitalization is inflated by at least an order of magnitude and maybe by a factor of 20. That changes everything. And then lastly, on the issue of complications, I, I've actually been invited on a, a, a number of occasions via email and comments to, to address this issue of complications. Uh, here, too, yes, it's very important, and, and it is clear that COVID can inflame the heart, possibly other vital organs, and it does seem like that can occur even sometimes in young people who have mild infection without a lot of symptoms. But we don't do that kind of testing for organ inflammation routinely in other infections. And so here we lack context. We don't know how often there's transient inflammation of vital organs when you have a systemic infection. It may be more common than we know. I have 30 years of clinical experience and I have seen myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, with a wide variety of infections that are usually unrelated with cardiovascular disease. Most people recover. We also know there's a particular type of cardiomyopathy, which is a, a temporary dysfunction of the, the heart's pumping function that can occur, and occurs more commonly in women than men, but it can occur in both. It's, it's quite common with any severe stress, physical or even psychological. The other thing is, if we have in fact had 67 million cases in the United States, and, and I'm quite confident we've had that many or more, it's just, it just falls directly out of the global epidemiology. These are not contrived numbers. This is an obvious truth. I mean, otherwise, the mortality toll in the United States is uniquely higher than among any other population. COVID particularly likes to kill Americans as opposed to Germans or Italians or Icelanders or anybody else. That makes no sense. So if we've had 67 million cases 
and if there is a high propensity for cardiac inflammation or other organ system complications, we should have seen a spike in young healthy people presenting to their doctors and hospitals with cardiac inflammation or other signs of organ system failure after an asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic bout of COVID, and we've seen no such spike. I'm, I'm carefully tracking all of the epidemiology on the pandemic, and there's been no such bump in unexplained cardiac uh, crises, which means that it's rare. Uh, the risk to young people is not zero, but the risk of going to college in the first place is not zero. Sadly, every year we hear about deaths due to alcohol intoxication or the misguided um, practice of hazings with adverse outcomes. And we'd like to get those risks to zero too, uh, but we don't shut down universities around the country because the risk is something higher than zero. We just keep working to minimize it. It looks as if the risk of COVID to young people is lower than the risk of alcohol to young people by a lot, lower than the risk of hazings by some factor as well. So I don't think we need to shut universities and colleges down when we see a flare in case counts. What we need to unbundle is case counts from casualty counts. High case counts, low casualty counts, that's a good thing. And yes, I would include complications like cardiac inflammation among the casualty counts, but there too, the numbers look to be very, very low. This is a low risk to a large segment of the population, and we should proceed through the pandemic accordingly.